Hey guys, it's Rodney here, and today we are bringing back, if many of you remember, the Back in Black podcast. Uh, long requested to come back. Long requested to come back. It's going to be me and uh, Gavin, OG Kush. Um, that is me. Jip Too Hard. Yes. Um, and we're going to be breaking down uh, some Hawkeye football, some Big Ten football for you. Um and we're excited to bring this to you. Um, we'll just go over the agenda here real quick. But we've got Kirk Ferentz, who recently, uh, actually today, as we're recording this, came out that he was suspended for the first game, um, which is obviously something we really want to touch base on. Um, we'll check out the preseason AP uh, Top 25, what the, what the beat writers seem to think for this year. Um, we'll talk about the Big Tens, you know, some floors and ceilings, some over-unders. Um and we'll, we'll touch base on, can you believe it, Gavin? There's 18 teams that we're touching base on. 18 teams in the Big Ten. Uh, that is just... Big it's, Ten. It's something I'm going to take a while for me to wrap uh, my head around. And I don't think got, I'll ever get uh, there. I know. And then we've got uh, a, a couple of picks we'll do um, from uh, the, the first Saturday in college football, week zero, coming up here, uh, coming up tomorrow. And then, uh, hold up, I'm going to cut here. This is going to be released tomorrow, so talk like Saturday is tomorrow. Anyways, and then we're going to talk about, you know, the Hawks. I mean, Iowa football is eight days away from, from kicking off a football game, um, and they're going to be without their head coach, so there's definitely a lot to talk about there, uh, even if it is Illinois State. Um, and without further ado, let's get into this. I mean, first of all, boys, Make sure you like and subscribe to the channel here. We appreciate it. <laughs> I got a plug. Also, thank you to our great sponsors uh, over at Anheuser-Busch, Bush Light, best beer in sports. Um, and we also like to thank our sponsors over at Swarm Vodka. Be sure to pick up some Swarm Vodka. Sure. Kirk Ferentz, in a press conference yesterday, came out and addressed – the rumors that he was indeed suspended for one game. They had announced it the day prior on the, all the social medias. And Kirk is not going to be coaching against Illinois State to open the season up. Your reaction? Wow. Pretty surprising, honestly, to see Kirk being accused by the NCAA and convicted. And of a recruiting violation and admitting, and admitting. in a press conference, which by such the way, such a man of integrity. He handled the press conference, and I and I know it's the little things, but it's just he handled the press conference so well, um, and it's just something that you know it's a situation that he never has been in before in his life. This will be the first Iowa football game since he took over in '99 that he will not be the head coach of, and you know it's a challenging situation, but he uses his you know his vast experience you know we're we're going to be on 25 years of Kirk Ferentz in charge of the Iowa football program and it's never been a problem things like this aren't have never been a problem and now what I really want to touch on here is the amount of schools that have done this and have not had an NCAA oh. investigation and have not had to deal with you know suspensions it's absolutely crazy to think about yep yep I mean, it's it's the same thing. Looking back at the uh, gambling situation last year, you know. Absolutely. I mean, there's like a bullseye on the back of Iowa, and 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 for that matter, we'll loop our friends out west, Iowa State, in on this too. I mean, yeah, we were the only two programs to have any sort of uh, investigation, and it came from our own state attorney's office. Yep. Somebody was headhunting, and and it lost Iowa State their quarterback. It lost Iowa, some incredible players on all, both sides of the football. It was really – it tainted reputations. I know Keegan Johnson ended up, uh, you know, playing really well at Kansas State last year, and I'm happy for him. But you have to think of him, and, and, and Arlen Bruce was affected too, and I don't really care as much about him. But had that <laughs> played an impact – on the field, you know, or when their decision was made to, hey, I'm going to transfer out, was this hanging over their head? 
It's a possibility for sure. And then Iowa State, of course, lost their quarterback, Hunter Deckers, who actually they probably benefited from that. Rocco Becht ended up being a fairly, fairly solid quarterback for them. Hunter Deckers was basically the Deacon Hill of Ames. So they, they did that. And another thing important to note about the suspension, though, is that it's self-imposed by the University of Iowa. I mean, you were talking about integrity. They're making a decision yeah. to come out and, you know, make this public and, and, and own up for their mistake. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I don't know what else you would expect from a man like Kirk in a place like the University of Iowa. Yeah, I mean, Kirk's been... Kirk's been, like I said at the top, for 25 years, and and we've always had a clean program. And this is really the first that's ever come of it. And the fact that, once yeah. again, which is what you touched on earlier as well, where is this? where are these investigations on Nick Saban in Alabama, you know, Kirby Smart in Georgia, you know, guys exactly. who have had players come out from other teams and say, hey, like they came out and they said, hey, we'll pay you 600 grand if you get in the portal. And they were still on the roster, weren't in the portal. And there's no investigation for that. But there well, is because of, I guess, everyone hates Iowa because they don't score points. I'm not really sure where this is coming from. Why Why is Iowa one of these programs right now that seems to be in the bullseye of the NCAA? I think because they, they kind of don't play into the system. I think they just do things differently and they do things right. And I think – the establishment of college football really is not a fan of that. Deep state theory. Nice. The deep state of NCAA. Yes. That's very I funny. mean, yeah, seriously. <laughs> oh, I mean, everyone's got the big flashy cars and all this stuff that they're doing to recruit. Lamborghinis. Yeah. Hey, come here. You get a Hellcat. I mean, I was not going to do that. They'll never do that. It's This is a place where you come to become you a better man this. and a better football player. You tell me this and, real quick. Sorry to interrupt you, but yeah, Iowa players, when they do nail deals and stuff, how often is it that they're working with the Stead Family Children's Hospital? Oh, all the time. And donating money that they're making off nail. To right, and spending time in the community and really... Exactly. Yeah. And... And we see that. And then we've got Utah. They give all of their players F 150s. Florida. Yeah, they got a big Hellcats. pickup truck. Texas, they've got yeah. Lamborghinis. It's absolutely crazy. And I think that the people in charge of NCAA right now, and it's really, it comes down to Mark Emmert, president of the NCAA. How are you not looking at this and thinking, wow, we have failed at a high level for allowing this to happen? Yes, absolutely. Yep. And I mean, it's, and not it's disgusting. Doing about it either. Yeah, it's a shambles. It's awful. I and, mean, I can't believe this is college football. This is not what I grew up with. Right, and and like we mentioned earlier, with us being in the bullseye here um, in Iowa City, we've got Caden Proctor's situation, which has not been touched yet. That Iowa had to deal with. Caden Proctor, you know, had mentioned it in an interview, right? <laughs> that we had committed this level three violation, which is actually less severe, uh, the lower the number, the higher the severity of the violation. Sort of like a DEFCON system. Yeah, exactly. So like a level one violation is like, you know, what SEC schools end up getting caught for, some of them anyways. Like the Ole Miss, remember that, in the Tennessee a couple years ago, got massive level one violations um, and lost, you know, postseason privileges, scholarships. So it's, once again, not really this it, – it, it's a big deal in the sense that we unfortunately won't have Kirk week one, but it could be worse. And and that Caden Proctor situation, which was, like I said, him mentioning in an interview that we were texting him while he was at Alabama, maybe he even purposefully just transferred here to do that, just to transfer right back to Alabama. Who knows? But – just a, a crazy situation right now. Very crazy. Very, very crazy. And, you know, just to circle back to that Kirk suspension, I think, who else would you want to replace him but Seth Wallace? I think that Seth is the man for the job. We'll talk about that a little more when we preview uh, week one's Illinois State game. But absolutely, Seth Wallace, 
the man for the job, and, and it does make you question the timing of the announcement that he was the associate head coach. Did they know this was coming? Um, but I'm glad that they had you know the foresight and to put a system in place. And and all not only even just a system for you know this one incident, but you know however many years down the road when Kirk decides it's time to call it a day, we'll have a an existing you know plan that we can transfer to. And we actually saw yeah. Utah football do the same thing this year, where they uh or I guess it's it's very similar, but they they named a head coach in waiting despite you know Kyle Whittingham still being uh, the head man in Utah. So. Do we see a lot of schools maybe doing this where you have a longer tenured coach, you want to kind of have a smooth transition into the next aspect, and then promoting from within I think is probably the best way to do that. Oh, yeah, I would certainly agree. I think that's how you keep a culture going, and that's 100%. how you really maintain like the idea of a program, you know? Exactly. So we take a look. At the AP Top 25 poll. Now, obviously, Iowa is 25th, um, and we, we knew that, uh, and I'm sure most of you knew that. Also, a fun stat I just want to throw in there about Kirk's suspension. Uh, in eight days, that'll mark the first Iowa football game since November 25th, 1978, that was not coached by Hayden Fry or Kirk Ferentz, which wow. is an incredible statistic. Wow. I, I mean, what other program can you say that about? There isn't one. No, not even close. Not even close. Not even close. So Wh who would be the closest, do you think? Two coaches in 79. I mean, it has to be – Ooh, it's, it can't be Utah because Urban, Me Urban Meyer was not there for a long time before Kyle Whittingham took over. Um, Alabama had a revolving door. I don't think anyone's even close. Maybe Oklahoma State. Maybe. But yeah. 78? No, nobody's even close. Penn State's three yeah. coaches away from 78. They're three away, so they've had how many? Five? Well, they had Joe Pa for 45, 50 years, That's whatever true. it was. And then they had Bill O'Brien for that little gap, and then they've had fucking Baldy since then. So they've had three. I mean, that's that's fairly close. That's probably the closest that you it's can get. It's the closest you're going to get. But that's and we all know how that the Joe Pa situation ended. So. Well, that's, that's, you know, there's something to be said about <laughs> running a clean football program in Kirk Ferentz. Yep. Joe Paterno most certainly did not do that. Um, we've got the AP poll right in front of us right now. Um, and the first thing I want to touch base on here is I, the top four. I have the same top four teams in the top four. I have no problems with the top four or the way it's ordered. Um I think those are clearly the four best teams this year. I'm surprised uh, Ohio State not getting More as many first-place first place votes. Yeah, I was going to also touch on that. Even Oregon as well. I think Oregon is going to be a fantastic football yeah. team this year. I think they're going to, yep. even if they don't beat Ohio State, they're going to give them the game of the year, and and they're set up for it for success. I mean, they've got Dylan Gabriel coming into the program from Oklahoma, you know, didn't really fit into Oklahoma's passing system. He fits in perfectly with Oregon's passing system. He's kind of like what I've described him as, like a point guard, but a quarterback. You know, short, concise passes. We're not holding on to the ball too long. Oregon's got the system in place, you know, the formations, the playbook in place to do exactly that. And I think that's why Oregon's going to be really good this year. And then moving on to Alabama at five, I think Alabama's maybe a touch too high. I don't know your thoughts. I I don't hate them at five, honestly. I think you have questions, obviously, with the new head coach coming in and somebody like Nick, Nick Saban leaving. But right. I they have a strong roster returning, and I think, I mean, they're going to be up there no matter what. So I, I just don't. I don't see, hate them at five. I don't see Alabama at five. Their quarterback needs to be improved and you're bringing in an entire new coach an entire new culture yeah it's, but who are you going to put in front of them i would put you know i mean maybe old miss i like old miss at I, five probably old miss i would put in front of them i would consider putting notre dame and penn state and even missouri and utah in front of Alabama really at this point i think utah is just one of those teams that's going to be good you know they're going to be good you know, they've been extremely solid for the last several years when they've had a healthy quarterback cameraizing, 
I mm-hmm. mean, he won. He's won back to back Pac-12 championships in years that he's played. Um, I just think Utah is going to be solid. I think I need to to see Alabama play football, and they have a tough schedule too. I need to see Alabama win some games before. I'm going to give them the benefit of a doubt at that five spot. You know what I mean? I think that's fair. I think that's fair. And I don't know. But, yeah. I don't know. I I don't hate him. At, I still don't hate him at five. But I, I where where do you have him in your top 25? Um, Alabama? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Alabama right now for me, they're sitting at number 10 right now. So okay. I just have them, you know, a couple spots lower. And behind those teams that I that I mentioned, for the most part, I I think I think that's fair. I think you could put them anywhere in the top twelve, and I think that's fine because I mean, ultimately uh, it's be it's a playoff contender. We know they're going they're going to be in it for they're the playoffs. Alabama. Yeah. I mean, they but like I said, they have to go to Wisconsin, play Georgia, go to Tennessee, go to LSU, go to Oklahoma. I mean, that is five games right there that are brutal. And then they have to also host Missouri, who's going to be a good football team, host Auburn. That game's always close. I mean, Alabama to me is – is a, there's a big question mark. But moving on, um, the next team that jumps out at me here really – I mean, I have no problems with any of those placements. I mean, you could put Michigan lower, but you have to respect the defending champions. I mean, yeah, they won the national um, championship. And they're barely, they're barely cracking the top right. ten here. And I think Clemson at 14 is a joke. Personally, I I would agree, but what what do you think about Florida State? I think Florida State respect is valid right now. I'm not 100 percent sure on Florida State, but they had a really good football team last year, and similar to Michigan, they deserve to get some respect carried over from yeah. last year because they got yeah, screwed think... last year, and they have a fairly easy schedule. I mean, they have two really tough games, which is at Miami, at Notre Dame. They get Clemson at home. I just think that this is a team that's going to win 10, 11 games and be in the t- in the running for a playoff spot. I would agree. Just yeah. because the ACC is so soft. Yeah. But, you know, Michigan, I I think Michigan might need to be higher just to go back to them. I Yeah? I mean, they're not the same. It's not all the same guys, but it's, it's still Michigan. And you have a, a guy that was hired from within the program – and that really demonstrated his abilities against teams like Penn State last year, you know. Oh, and Ohio State. And Ohio State, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I don't know, like, I don't know that you can really discount them. I think they should be – maybe you could put them up there at fifth, honestly. Uh, and, I mean, it's still Michigan. And, and you know, think about Texas. What if they What if they, What if if they? they beat Texas? Okay, Joel I mean, Klatt. What if they beat Texas? What if they beat them? That's a good question. I mean, Joe Joe Klatt, you know, I think he got a lot of flack for that that comment, but what if they beat Texas? I mean, seriously. I mean, that is a fair point. And, and Michigan is a team that, you know, I mean, why it... is going to sway for a lot of people. I mean, you could have them as low as 15. You could have them, like you said, as high as five. Um, and obviously, and I, we don't have the coaches poll pulled up right now, but Michigan did get a first place vote in the coaches poll. Yeah, so, I mean, you just can't discount the defending national champions like that. I don't know. I think I think having them at nine might be a little disrespectful. Yeah, and 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 that's a fair statement. The next team I want to talk about is Clemson, though, for sure. With, with which we already touched a little bit on. They've got a tough schedule. Moving down the line, I like most of these teams' placements. I'm not a hundred percent sold on Miami, but they have a good roster and they have the schedule mm-hmm. in front of them. They definitely can be a playoff caliber team this year, but to to be honest, I have no faith in them. And yeah, yeah, I, I mean they play a a fairly easy schedule. I mean the first week is going to be a big benchmark for them. If they can go into the swamp uh, and beat Florida, I'll be sold on Miami. Yeah, right but now, I mean you guys can't be. Can we look back last year and and think about that loss at? Uh, against Georgia Tech. Loss against Georgia Tech. Questionable yeah, I mean, losses and on the road with so, questionable ball movement choices, questionable clock management. I mean, it was just it was the coaching, coaching losses. The exactly. coaching is a big question mark there, and I don't know if they'll be able to have the coaching ability to win enough games to really keep themselves in contention in that top twenty area. And I like. I think they might drop out of the top twenty-five. Honestly, I like that mention um, about the coaching for sure. Because we saw what an absolute disaster poor 
game <laughs> management coaching can get you. Moving right on down to the next team, Texas A&M. That's another team with a high ceiling, I think. But just as high as their ceiling is, I think they have a low floor too. And that's kind of, of a similar situation Miami's in. They have a brand new yeah. football or a head football coach, Mike Elko from Duke. Used to be a defensive coordinator at Texas A&M, so he knows his way around. I'm, I have a lot of faith in their head coach. I just don't know if the first year this schedule sets up for them to make some sort of run. I mean, it's it's while it's not a difficult schedule, it's still a first year coach. You're still playing in the SEC. You know, you still have to play Texas, Missouri, Florida, Notre Dame to open, LSU. You have to go on the road mm-hmm. to South Carolina and Auburn, two tough places to play. Mm-hmm. Have to go on the road to the swamp. I just don't know if this is the schedule for him. I don't think so. And I think a team that we need to go back, I think we kind of glossed over is Tennessee. Tennessee. I think uh, wow. Tennessee could be a serious playoff contender here. I, I mean, am... looking at their schedule, yes, it seems fairly favorable. They have to play Alabama at home, and then they have to go to Georgia. But if they win one of those games, I think – they probably make the playoff, right? I, I think they I, can. I think they so. pro- they'll probably They're handle Oklahoma. Game. Yeah, like I said, Oklahoma is a question mark this year. You know, if the new quarterback. I know Tennessee is a new quarterback yeah. too, but Tennessee's man, new quarterback is know, gonna be. I know a lot of you Iowa fans watched that bowl game. That Tennessee quarterback is legit. He is the real yes. deal. Now is his first start. He's only gonna get better with the, the you know spring and fall ball under his yes. belt. They've got a Look, and they've got yes. a benchmark week two. They're playing NC State in Charlotte week two. NC State, a very good football team this year. We're gonna know right away if Tennessee is legit or not. So yep. there's a lot of teams where you'd be maybe you know pumping the brakes on the preseason hype, but we don't have to wait you know six seven games like for example a team like Nebraska who has a really soft schedule to begin the season. We don't have to wait to see if they're legit. We'll see if Tennessee's legit. They have the first four weeks of the season they're playing two ranked teams both away from home. That'll mm-hmm. be an easy benchmark test. And just to, to real quick touch on, just we'll talk about all these Big 12 teams at once because they're all so you know close together, with the exception obviously being Utah up at 12. But the Big 12 is going to be competitive at the top this year. I think another team that I want to talk about right now too while we're talking about the Big 12 is West Virginia. I think West Virginia has a really good opportunity week one at home against Penn State to get a win at home early in the mm-hmm. season to get them confident a big win. for the rest of the year. I think West Virginia has a chance of being a really good football team this year. I think the Big 12 at the top is as good, if not better, than every other conference. Maybe not, you know, at the top, like or Ohio State and Oregon, but that three through five, I think they're the deepest at the top, I guess is what I'm trying to say, for lack of better words. I think so. I think I think you can look at the Big Ten and probably pick out two teams that are going to be in contention to win right, the title. Exactly. And maybe Penn probably State, the same with maybe Penn the State, SEC, but they can't win a big game. SEC, there's two clear. I mean, really three. I mean, jo- the SEC is pretty top loaded. If we're going to be it is, here. but I don't. I I we'll honestly, put, I don't. I don't see SEC. Ole Miss winning the SEC, and I don't yeah, see. I, don't think I mean, Ole maybe I think Texas will be up there, and I think, think Alabama will be up there. I think if I had to say right now, I, I would say Texas Georgia in the championship game. Um, yeah, which I think would be a fantastic game, and it would be both teams going to the playoff for sure. But right. in that Big Twelve, I I really like Arizona. I think they're they've got a lot of guys returning from what was a a ten win team. That, yep dismantled Oklahoma in the bowl game. Um, they did do that. Kansas, if their quarterback, Jalen Daniels, can stay healthy, I think Kansas can be really good. Yep, Kansas will be fun. Um, and then, like I said, West Virginia, I think it's going to be a good conference. But not to talk yeah. too much about the Big 12 here, we'll talk about these last two Big 10 teams that are in here, which is USC and Iowa. Um, USC ranked higher than Iowa. Gavin, your reaction? Terrible, terrible. I mean, you have a USC, a team that went – Seven and six last year. Eight I mean, and five. Oh, eight and five. Oh, sorry, my apologies. Thought they were worse. Um, Finish the season. Right? I mean, they they looked worse. I don't. I mean, I don't get it. Honestly, I feel like this is a situation like with ranking Nebraska during the Scott Frost era. I think they're gonna. They're probably gonna implode right at the start of the season. I mean, we can look at their schedule uh, have, coming up have, here. They but... have four really tough games to start the season. And, yeah, and we'll talk I, about USC a little bit more when we're going through every single team. But just to say it right now, they've got LSU, Michigan, and Wisconsin in the first four weeks of the season. So, yeah, but not looking on, great for on them. On the flip side, just like Tennessee, we will know if USC is legit 
right away. That's right. They yep. have very tough games. If they go out and take care of business in really either one of those LSU or Michigan games, then I'll start to feel a little bit more positive about USC and their chances and maybe making a run at a playoff this year. But the schedule is just so tough for them. Yeah, I agree. And I think these, these Pac-12 teams coming in the Big Ten are going to have it harder than they might think and initially. That is, a very true, that is a very true statement. With What I think the exception is is Oregon, because I think Oregon plays defense as well as anybody in the Big Ten Conference. Yep, I, yep. and that's why, they're, that's why they're being talked up. Yep. I think it's, I think it's fair. Moving uh, just to briefly touch on a couple teams in the receiving votes I want to mention. I think App State is primed for a, for to be that group, one of those group of five teams that's going to be in the mix for that 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 uh, that bid for the playoff. I yep. think App State has a good chance of, um, you know, they have a schedule for it. I'm not saying that they're going to go 12 and 0, but I'm saying if they do, they're definitely going to be, you know, up in in that discussion with the playoff spot. I mean, they have. Clemson on the road, which I'm not saying they're going to win, but like I said, they have the opportunity to do it, and I think they're a good enough team that they might be able to do it. And uh, yep. also, quite a few Big Ten teams receiving votes here in Nebraska, Wisconsin, and Washington. Um, Washington, obviously, the national runner-up last year, getting maybe a little disrespected in this uh, in this uh, AP poll. Yeah, but I think the the way their program has sort of just fallen apart after that, I think it's... They've lost, Basically, everyone from that There's... team, they lost their staff. It's yeah, going to be don't... a tough rebuild. Um, I will say, if it... anyone's going to get Washington back to that level, though, in three, four years, it's going to be Jed Fish. I mean, look yeah. at what he did at Arizona. He turned around a, a, a two-win team into a ten-win team in just two seasons. Yep. Yep. I think there's just too many and, and question marks it, currently. He does it through recruiting as well. Not even yeah. just the portal, going out, getting guys, building a culture. I think he can do it at yeah. Washington, but I don't think it's gonna take this year. Well let's yeah. move on. We're gonna talk about some uh we're gonna talk about some Big Ten teams here. We're gonna talk about some over unders in the Big Ten. And obviously the first here is Illinois. Um, as we take a peek at what Illinois has cooking for them, uh like uh, I have wrote up there, we've got uh, Zachary Franklin coming in from UTSA for Illinois. You know, he's an was an All Conference guy at UTSA, so there's some optimism mm-hmm. for some speed on the outside for them. But they have a tough schedule, and and, and frankly, I don't see I don't see them hitting their over on five and a half with this schedule, Gavin. Um, I mean, we can take a look at it here. I think Eastern Illinois. Probably going to be a win. Kansas, I'm sure they'll lose that. Kansas is I, – I like Kansas. Um, Central Michigan, they could win. Not they will Nebraska. win, I'm sure. Uh, they're not beating Nebraska, they're not Penn, beating State. Penn State. They, Purdue's a toss-up. Purdue, yeah. They, lost they could win Purdue that. Last call season. it three. They lost to Purdue last um, season. We'll, we'll call that three, though. So we're three and three, three and four, three and five with the next two. Maybe Minnesota's five. winnable. Michigan State's winnable. So I'm seeing a ceiling right here of five wins. I think they could maybe sneak six. I think Northwestern maybe they could win that. I don't know. I think I think that's a a high ceiling for them is six. I think yeah, realistic fair. is is four or five wins. Absolutely, and and I would say I mean I could see this team winning three games. I don't think they're going to win less than three games, but I could see this team winning three games. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely could happen. I mean, like we said, we've got tough tough teams, especially. Kind of getting into October there. Yeah. Really I mean, three three two. top ten teams here preseason. So. And a road game in Lincoln. And a really good Kansas team. I, I, yep. I just don't see, you know, Illinois getting back to where they were a couple years ago when they uh, when they won nine games. Yep. Let's go to Indiana, who has a brand-new head coach this year. They fired Tom Allen. They brought in Kurt Signetti from James Madison, who brought 11 of his players with him to Indiana. Remember James Madison was a ten win or sorry an eleven win team last year would have won the Sun Belt if they were eligible to play in a championship obviously the transitioning rules but they've got you know wins on the schedule for sure I can see this team starting four and zero but I don't see a yeah ton, absolutely I don't see a ton of opportunities for them after that yeah I think uh, you can maybe look at Northwestern and Michigan State as potential wins I Purdue. would say Purdue would be a win for them. I would put them yeah. at five for the ceiling. I don't think they're gonna go on the road and beat Northwestern or Michigan State. I mean you have them at, you have them winning the f- potential first four games you're gonna have a ceiling of five. I don't know I think I think they could win 
potentially six or seven games here. Six game ceiling, I, you think? I think so. I think a six game ceiling is well, fair. I think more more excitingly, let's talk about the floor this team has. Because this is not a super low floor. They've got three wins in a non conference, pretty much locked down. Yeah. I would absolutely. Say. Um and that would probably be it. Three and nine would be the floor. I mean, they could lose all their conference games. It could happen. It could happen. I don't and think I, it's but, gonna happen, you know, but it could happen. I don't happen. think it will. I think they might surprise. I think floor would be three and nine. I think that there's a lot of energy around this program right now. Um, They brought in a really good guy. Um, The fan base seems to have a lot of energy uh, for Kurt Signetti and what he's going to be doing at Indiana. Yeah, and he certainly does as well. But yeah, I don't. I don't think taking the over on five and a half is a bad bet. All right, betting advice is not advice. Just it's not. Know. This is not betting advice. This is not. Do not gamble. These are predictions. If well, you do gamble, gamble gam- responsibly. Gamble if Call one eight hundred. Bets off. If you have a gambling problem. Off. And now let's talk about everyone's team that we're that we're excited to talk about, and that's our Hawks. Um, obviously, Tim Luster coming in to replace Brian Ferens on the offensive side of the football, and returning seventeen starters. Obviously, the loss of Cooper DeGene will hurt, but Iowa's defense is not going to be a problem. At no. all. And not even close. I think probably going to be contending for, if not the best defense in the country. Yeah. And I think going back to that Cooper DeShane point, I think every time you have a big name leave like that, there's always somebody weighing in the wings. Exactly. I mean, and we've seen it Phil so Parker, before, especially in the secondary. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that I don't think we should worry about that too much. I think and, it was fun. You know, Cooper's run was fun, and I, it, it's sad how it ended, but I think I think we're covered in that area. And and then once again, this, the schedule sets up nicely for the Hawks. Only one preseason top 25 team. That's obviously on the road to Ohio State. That's going to be a loss, but that puts the ceiling at 11-1. and one. Now, the floor is where it gets interesting because there are some games on the schedule that could trip the Hawks up, particularly the one that I have an arrow pointing to at Maryland. That's a long, mm-hmm. long long road trip i know they have the bye week historically iowa not been great off bye weeks maryland gonna be a gritty team next year they always are i know we have a good history against maryland but i just think if you catch them you know we got a short week against nebraska the week after that i think that's a team that or a game that this team could lose i also think that this team could lose to wisconsin at home i i you know i don't hate those calls but i think the November steamroller is just so brutal in its attack that it's it might not be overcome. I don't wow. I honestly I don't see us losing any of those games in November. I think I think Kirk really dials it up to eleven once we get into November, I, once it gets cold. Another you know? interesting thing to point out is Kirk Ferens with not coaching the Illinois State game would need to win eleven games in the regular season to tie uh, Amos Alonzo Stagg's record, or sorry, to break Amos Alonzo Stagg's record for um, all-time Big Ten wins as a head football coach. Um, so he would need a 10 because he will not get the Illinois State game on his record. That will also play a factor in, I think, the team's mentality going forward. Give them maybe a chip on their shoulder that you don't want to give an Iowa football team a chip on their shoulder. I mean, look at our best teams over the years. You know, even going to the first half of that 2021 team, that 2015 team had a huge chip on their shoulder. Nobody thought they were going to be good. We're 25th mm-hmm. in the AP poll this year. I know that's a little bit more respect than that 2015 team got, but I think that the defense this year will be probably the best unit under Phil Parker as a whole. I think there's a lot of veteran guys that you don't want coming back, especially in the middle of a defense in that in that front seven. We're going to be mm-hmm. scary as hell. Yeah, and, and deep. honestly, so deep. Um, I think I I don't think you can count them out quite yet against Ohio State. I I I would. I say mean, that those people will be surprised at how competitive that game will be. That's what I'll say yeah. about Ohio State. They have a really good defense. We might not score a lot of points, but I don't think they're going to score a ton of points either. Um, exactly. I think this 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 defense is a, a national title level defense, and I I mean that can keep you in breath. any football game. We just need a breath of offense, a breath. That's just a touch. All we need one tenth in offense 
this team's going to the playoff. Moving on to the Maryland Terrapins, who last year went 8-5. and five. They obviously hired Brian Ferens on their staff as an analyst. They're losing Talia Tagovailoa, who famously threw five interceptions against Iowa in 2021. Um, but this will be their first year without him at the helm. It's going to be an interesting, uh, interesting, you know, kind of transfer of the of the baton, if you will. I think Maryland, who has been kind of building, you know, they've been winning eight games. They've won eight games the last two years um, with Mike Loxley. I think they're going to benefit great most, you know, greatly from not having to play as you look at the schedule, Ohio State or Michigan. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, the East West division dissolving is going to help them out here a lot. If the quarterback play is good, I th- I think there's a chance that this team could be eight zero going into that Oregon game. There is a chance. Absolutely. I'm not saying it's going to yeah. happen. But if you look, no, at the there's a strong schedule, possibility. Up until that USC game, it really they don't they don't play anybody. Yeah. I mean, but you know, and I know Maryland has a, is going to lose a game, but they shouldn't because they always do. And maybe it's at Indiana. Maybe it's Michigan State at home. But maybe it's Northwestern. You know, it, it could be anyone. And of course, Maryland did lose a Northwestern last year when going eight and five. But I just don't think you can. You can put this team when they're on your schedule as an automatic win. I think they're going to be tougher yeah. than that this year. I think that that game that we're going to have to go to College Park, you know, late in November. I think that there's potential, but that's going to be one of our tougher games of the year. And and, and like you said, it'll be interesting to see how Kirk has the boys prepared, you know, in that atmosphere late in November, They're trying to make a push for a, for a, for a playoff appearance. It'll be very interesting to see that game. Moving on it to will. the ninth ranked in the preseason poll, Michigan Wolverines. Michigan obviously coming off the national championship win. They kept the they kept the uh, new head coaching hire to within. They promoted their offensive coordinator, Sharon Moore, to head coach. Um, you would have to think that that would make great bounds for like you talked about that culture. Seems like a fairly nice schedule. You have. Th- three really tough games, but I think I see them winning. I mean, you've got three preseason I mean, uh, top five teams on yeah. the schedule. Two, but I have them, I have them you at have, a four. Uh, wow. You eight. have two of the other three teams that, that were in the playoff last year on your schedule. Yeah. You also but, have Ohio State and Oregon. I, you have I don't know. I, I don't see a reason that they can't win. All of their games, they they certainly could go twelve and zero, and I don't think that that game at Ohio State is going to be winnable. I don't think it's realistic, but I think it's possible. I see no chance of that. I'm not super high on Michigan this year. I have Michigan losing. I think you could look at this schedule and go four easily. I yeah, I think I think eight and four is a floor, and I think, but I think yeah. There's a possibility that they win 11, 12 games here. I think Fresno State is going to be a tougher game than people people think for, for the Michigan Wolverines. Especially with that Texas game looming week two. Yeah, what if they lose to Fresno State? I mean, you could you could I, flip, flip Joel Klatt right on his head. I don't think it's going to happen. I, I, I'm very confident it won't happen, but I think Fresno State's going to, going to score some points. I think that game's going to be, you know, two possessions closer – than you would think. Yeah. And I think but also, Texas is going to be a really, really tough test. Now, I will say for Texas, yeah. Michigan, Texas's front four is probably their weakness on defense. And Michigan, we know, loves to run the football. That could be a matchup exactly. that Michigan could exploit in that Texas game. That'll be something to watch for yes. sure. As we move on yes. to, to little brother in that state, Michigan State, who had a horrific last year, really just a, really everything that could have went wrong did – your head coach got caught jacking off and fired. Um, you went four and eight. Yeah. Your two conference wins were, I think, Indiana and uh, I don't even know who your other conference win was. I can't even remember. Indiana and Purdue, maybe. Indiana maybe. and Illinois. It was not a very good year for the Michigan State Spartans. Now, they do have – a lot of upside this year, in my opinion. They have Aiden Childs coming in with 
Oregon State head coach Jonathan Smith coming in from Oregon State. You know, he's a dual threat guy, very raw, you know, hasn't gotten the snaps, but I think that he's an athlete and I think that he can make things happen. Depending on how he plays, I could see them making a bowl game this year. Yeah, you could see him making a bowl game and you could see him I mean, I could see him being even worse than last year, honestly. A hundred percent. Maryland right possible. at the start of the season. They have to play think, Boston College. I think that Boston Ohio College State, game. Oregon, tw- uh, Iowa, Michigan, all in a row. I think that's a brutal stretch. I don't know. I th- I mean, I could see them. They could. They might lose to Florida Atlantic. I mean, seriously. And, and, and I, the thing I think is going to be important here is even if they lose to Maryland, that Boston College game, that's not a good team and not a good conference. I understand it's on the road. That's not a tough place to play. Not being able to get the job done there will be absolutely critical. It will completely end the season for them. I'm not sure they would win another game at that they point. They would probably lose out. I mean, right. I think – but you you just don't know. I mean, they seriously – it's Michigan State. I mean, they were bad last year, and I don't – they have been bad for much the most better part, this year. with the exception of one year since Mark D'Antonio has left the program. Yeah. And that one year that they were there, they weren't really all that good. No. I mean, I know they won a New Year's Six game. I get it. But they lost to Purdue. Got absolutely baptized by Ohio State. They were a fraud. So it'll be interesting to see Michigan State if they have the right path moving forward. I think they do. I think they have a good coach. It'll be interesting to see that. We've got the Minnesota Golden Gophers up next. Now, if we remember last year, they completely fraudulently made a bowl game. They were 5-7. and seven. Should have been 4-8 and eight if um, officials and replay knew what they were doing in Iowa City. Um, but they got to make a bowl game off that and play a max school and win. But despite getting last mm-hmm. in the division, dead last, behind Illinois, behind Purdue. Um, and I know I have Aiden Childs on there as a key addition, but that is not true. Um but either way, um, we've got four ranked teams on the schedule for Minnesota. You've got North Carolina week one Thursday. The whole country will be watching. That's on mm-hmm. Fox. Um, that's a big game. I mean, that's their gold out game. That's, you yep. have to win that game, I think, if you want to make a bowl game. That's the game. Because if you win that game, you'll be 3-0 and going into that game against Iowa. And you never know what can happen in a rivalry game. And yep. you'll well, at least feel do, better though, about yourself. But... Well, right. But you'll at least feel better Floyd's about yourself. Home. You'll at least feel better about yourself being three and one than two and two at that point. With the next That's right. that yep. three game stretch where they play Iowa, Michigan, USC. That is a brutal three game stretch. The schedule doesn't really get a ton easier. They have to go to Rutgers, who's gonna be a really good team, I think. They have Penn State, if they have to go to Wisconsin. It, yep. They'll probably make a bowl game, but I honestly I hope they Go zero and twelve. I have Minnesota. I if I had to bet, I would bet the under. I, I I have no faith in this team. They they have nothing going for them. They have little experience at the quarterback position. I was actually in awe checking out who their quarterback was. They have five true freshmen on the depth chart. Um, That's yeah. I have no idea what they're going to be at the quarterback position. I you would think they'll be sound defensively. They've been sound defensively the last several years, and that's been a theme under PJ Fleck as well. They play good defense. But I just don't know if their offense is going to be worth any sort of shit. So that's where I have Minnesota. I'm not very high on them. We're moving on to Nebraska here. This is a team that a lot of people are high on. As you can see, 5-7 and seven last year, but the Vegas has it as 7.5 for the over-under this year. And that's mostly because of Dylan Riola. Yeah, I mean, I could see them winning all their games up to Ohio State. 100%. I don't think they will, but I, I could also see it's them possible. losing three games in that stretch. I, absolutely, I can see them losing to UTEP. It's just I have no idea what to expect from a Nebraska team at this point. I understand they have a better coach now than when Scott Frost was there. And I'm not saying by any means they are going to lose the UTEP, but you just don't know. They Nebraska has for the last several years, even last year with Matt Rule as head coach just found stunning ways to lose games. Absolutely stunning ways to lose games. Mm-hmm. They're up seven at Minnesota week one 
with like a minute 15 to play with Minnesota 4th and 15, and they lost that game in regulation. They lost to Iowa with ha having the ball on Iowa's side of the field with 20 seconds left, and they lost in regulation. I mean, it's just they find incredible ways to lose games. I don't know where to even feel about Nebraska, and I have them ranked in my top 25 in the preseason. But I'm just saying it could go anywhere, any sort of direction for the floor and the ceiling. Any sort of direction. It's just the Absolutely. first, the f like you said, those first seven games are such a cakewalk. Yeah. They are. And I mean, who's their toughest opponent there? Rutgers? I mean, Illinois is not going to be good. Purdue won't be good. Indiana won't be good. Colorado is. Uh, I mean, probably not going to be good. They'll be a they'll be a fraud. I mean, Colorado has good players, but I don't know if they have a good team. Colorado has I, very yeah. good players on the edge, at quarterback, um, even defensively in the secondary. They have very right. good players, but are they going to? And be that's a rivalry to, game. To I think. Games. I mean, Nebraska it's a night could game lose in that. Lincoln. I don't know. We'll have to see. Moving forward. We'll talk about Northwestern, who is playing, obviously, in a temporary stadium this year, which is hilarious. Um, probably won't be able to fill it. Also hilarious. And they lost their starting no, they'll get nowhere from last year to be the backup at Iowa. So the way the yeah. schedule lays out for them, there's a lot of wins in the beginning of the season. There aren't a lot in the second half. Yeah, I think Purdue and Illinois are probably sure wins. I think you can count I on think, those. But I think Purdue's going to give them a game. I think Purdue's going to be gritty. That's at Purdue. I think. I think Northwestern that, was kind of fun at the end of the season, though, and I think were, they, maybe they'll be able to carry that energy into this season. Then that could be true. And they have a young head coach, David Braun, who did obviously a fantastic yep. job last year, turning it around from one and eleven to eight and five with a a big bowl win over a good Pac-12 team in yeah. Utah, but. I just don't know what they're going to be without Brandon Sullivan. I don't know, but I think over four and a half is great money. Moving on to Ohio State. <coughs> Sorry. I'll be cut out. Moving on to Ohio State, who obviously was a fantastic last year. They lost their last game of the year at Michigan in a tight game. Bowl game. Obviously, people didn't play. Really, an eleven to one season for the Buckeyes. Yep. Um, and they have Chip Kelly now running the offense. Yep. This team is going to be a steamroller, and they have. I mean, they did not pick up the phone this year. If we're being honest, Akron, Western Michigan, and Marshall to start oh, the home. season, and then Michigan State. I mean, they have a real cakewalk leading up to that game against Iowa. Eight home games and two, and one of their true road games is at Northwestern, which will be at Wrigley Field. So that's a neutral site game. Um, they have to that will be packed Valley, with Ohio State fans, I'm sure. Eugene. Those are two tough games. Those are tough games, but I think Penn State is will probably be exposed I, in I, that I'm, game. I don't disagree, and that's been what we've seen the last several years. In Penn State, I don't. State I, I don't see James I, Franklin pulling that one off. I see Iowa being a potential trap game for this team. Yeah, I think I have them at a floor of ten and two. I think they'll probably win eleven I can games. I see this team going nine and three. They could go nine and three. You never know. I, I mean, they could lose Michigan against Michigan, or you know, something weird happens in that Iowa game. You know, yeah. you just. It's such an easy schedule. It's hard to put them nine and three worst case scenario. I mean, this is, this look, is look. in reality. This is a team that very easily could go twelve and zero, could win the Big Ten, could get that first round by in the in the college football playoff, and is number two in the AP poll in this preseason for a reason. I mean, they have you know, one of the greatest offensive minds in coaching running the offense. Yep, they had a very solid defense last year. Will continue to be one of the best in the country. And they got you know the, with the addition of Caleb Downs at corner as well, uh, a five star, just so speedy, gets everywhere, all over the field. Um, they're gonna be 
extremely solid on defense. They have a great offensive coordinator, maybe a little bit of a question mark at quarterback in my opinion, but they had a question mark at quarterback and won 11 games last year. I don't see them. Mm-hmm. I don't see them not winning 11 games this year. Yeah. But you know, there is a key factor looking at that Iowa game. If you, if you think back to 2017, first year offensive coordinator at Iowa and this year, Again, first year offensive coordinator at Iowa. That could be a brutal combination for the Ohio State Buckeyes. I mean, th- just think about that. Fun fact. Fun fact. It is a fun fact. Last time Iowa had a first state first year offensive coordinator, they won fifty five to twenty four. So oh, I love that. I love that pullback to the woodshed. Yes. That is a good thing to note. So Ohio State obviously going to be solid, and so, and so is this team, right? I mean, number three preseason, got got a first-place vote in the AP poll. Pac-12 runners-up. Obviously, 12-2 and two last year with the two losses both coming to the same team who ended up going to the national championship game. I mean, really a great year from, from Oregon. Great year, and it, it seemed like still kind of disappointing for them, you know? Right. They just couldn't get over Washington. That was right. just a and so that... tonight. And and yeah. the good news for them this year is Washington is not going to be Washington from last year. That's not a game that they really have to worry about. They do have to worry Absolutely. about Ohio State, though. That's a completely different beast than Washington, in my opinion, this year. And they have to worry about Michigan. They're going to the big house. Going to the big house. I mean, you can't, going cannot Madison. look over that game. Big game. Also at Madison. Madison. Um, a team that will probably be ranked at that point in the season. And they've got two quality Mountain West teams in a non-conference in Boise State and Oregon State. So they do. It, it's 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 a schedule that's difficult, but I think it just shows you know how good this team is that Vegas has their over under a ten and a half despite the schedule. I think they are that good. I think Michigan, Oregon is an, is a clear eleven and one team at the worst. I think they're natty or bust, just like Ohio State. Yeah, but you never know. I mean, playing in the Big Ten is going to be a different animal for Absolutely, this team. Absolutely, one hundred percent. Like we talked about those November road games. Weather could play a factor. Could be stuff something that Oregon's not used to. It'll be interesting to see how they are able to improvise and and be able to do what needs to be done to get the job done on the road, especially in this conference. Yep. These aren't road games against Arizona State and you know UCLA. Exactly. This is the Big Ten. You're playing in some of the toughest places to play in college football. And you're playing in a time of the year where the other team is more comfortable than you are. So exactly, it's something to think about for sure, especially with you know how sound Michigan's going to be on the defensive side of the football again. Let's go to another team that has a lot of expectations. You know they've been failing to get over the hump for quite some time, and I think there's a lot of optimism from a lot of people with the um, the 12 team playoff implementation and how that would affect Penn State. And as we see. Also, the removal of divisions. We don't have to play um, Michigan this year. Um, and they also are able to avoid Oregon in the in this schedule. So you're, you're yeah, avoiding, very favorable you know, schedule. two of the better teams in the conference. And you get Ohio State at home. I think that this team could win 10, 11 games. They have done oh, – you know, they've been that consistent. That's been the level that they've set for themselves and their program. Yeah. For the better part of the last five, six years. Yep. I think um, they're a likely bet for the playoff. And and I think that that game in Madison is going to be tough. I think that game at the Coliseum is going to be tough. USC's got a lot of speed. Um, and they have a great offensive mind in Lincoln Riley running that offense. So I think that's going to be a challenge for their defense. Um, but I, I I do see them winning that USC game for sure. I think they they will beat Wisconsin on the road. I think this team is going to go 10 to 11 and 1. I think that West Virginia game is as tough as any game on their schedule. I mean, that's a bit of a stretch when you have Ohio State, but sure. I, I, I think that going on the road week one, big noon Saturday, stripe out at Milan Pascar Stadium here in Morgantown. That's a that's a good yep. West Virginia team, and that's a that's a that's going to be a tough environment to win in. So I think that game is going to be tough for them as well. Moving on to a team that – um, is maybe predicted to be more towards the bottom. I think they were the last picked team in the preseason media poll. 
Um, and they have a, just a brutal schedule. I mean, four top eight teams on the schedule. Um, and it just does not really set up for them very well this year, does it? It does not. And I don't see them doing much better than last year. I think uh, I think four and a half is a good number for the over. Four and a half is a, I a, a the under. great line for them. I mean, Vegas just always knows where these teams will be. Except when it comes to Iowa, I think we kind of glossed over that, but they have them at eight ones. I think taking the over on eight is a great bet. Yeah, I just, I mean, Purdue, you've got one win in a non-conference. You've got two tough games, one very tough game, and what's basically going to be a neutral field game in your own stadium against their Mm -hmm. in-state rival Notre Dame, who obviously coming off the bye week, still going to be a game that you're not going to win and I think that you go on the road to your two other easiest games Michigan State and Indiana I think that this doesn't set up for them I'm I'm with you on the under on that one for sure and let's move on Mm -hmm. to a team that I'm definitely on the over for and that's the Rutgers Scarlet Knights this year oh yeah I mean very favorable schedule here look at this Howard Akron Virginia Tech I think they're at least winning two out of those three games 100%. 100%. UCLA is an easy win. I think they're winning. Minnesota, probably. Yeah. Illinois and Michigan State to close out the season. I think that this team, if they don't make a bowl game, might need to dissolve their football program. I, I'm, I'm seeing, as a best-case scenario here, honest to God, I'm seeing, I'm seeing nine, ten wins in this schedule. They absolutely could win ten games. 100%. Absolutely. They have a 17th ranked strength of schedule in the conference. They only have one ranked team, and that's the 23rd ranked team. And that's a right. question mark. USC, USC could be a fraud. USC is definitely a question mark. Um, and that's a game that they could win as well. And I think Virginia Tech could be a tough game for them. I mean, why can't why but, can't they go 12-0? and 0? Who knows? I mean, uh, they, they could team. go on a ridiculous run. The schedule is so easy. The schedule to do it. If Rutgers is worth any bit of a shit, they will win 8-9 to nine games this year. If they're worth yep. any bit of a shit. Nine and three this year will be the same as six and six last year with the schedule they had last year. Obviously, they were picked third or seventeenth in the conference. They've got five ranked teams on their schedule, including a tough non-conference schedule where they play two games away from home, including one in Death Valley. And they've got to go on the road to Rutgers, on the road to Nebraska, on the road to Washington, on the road to Penn State. On top of that, I don't see how this team gets to four wins much less six like vegas has it i mean they could they could i mean they probably have a four of one win 100 percent. i mean i think they're going to beat hawaii indiana could be a toss-up minnesota's a toss-up and i think fresno state's a toss-up with with ucla this year Mm -hmm. so I could see UCLA winning one game this year, 100%. I think that's their floor. 1-11, 4-8 for sure. UCLA, brand new coach, program got gutted. Uh, not like it's a you know a program with a lot of energy around it. The fan base doesn't support it. They have tarps over their end zones in their stadium. This is not yeah. a good place for the program to be right now. No. A terrible place. I mean, you're really not sure here. I think they will be bad. Moving on to the the USC Trojans, who we've talked about a little bit in terms of a question mark. Um, but they have some confidence at the quarterback position, Gavin. Yeah, USC is starting out immediately with a loss here, and. Then they have Utah State, and then they have to go to the big house, which is another certain loss. And then looking ahead on the schedule, I mean, you have Penn State, Notre Dame. I think I don't see them winning either of those games. I think this this team still has a ceiling of, I guess, eight wins. Moving on to the Washington Huskies. Now, Washington, once again, very good last year. We're not going to see that team this year. We're not. They lost but, their head coach. They lost the national championship game. Not ranked in the preseason polls, either of them. And they have a very tough schedule. They have to go to Kinnick Stadium. They have to go to Happy Valley. They have to go to Eugene. They have to go to Rutgers. 
all these are tough games, especially going to Rutgers on a on a short week. That's a long trip. That is a very long trip, and that's a that's going to be a key factor in that game. I think uh, Rutgers definitely has an advantage, but you never know. You could see this team starting out five and zero, and then you might have a hyped up matchup against the Michigan Wolverines. You never know. I don't think so, though. They do. Have... I don't think so. Either. Never, you never know. They do have Will you Rogers, never know. the Mississippi your... State quarterback, at uh, coming in in the transfer portal. Obviously, through for video game numbers at Mississippi State and Mike Leach's air raid offense. Um, so definitely a guy who's capable of throwing the football, but it's a question of if they can build the system around him. They need to improve on the defensive side of the ball. That was a problem even last year. And that will be a problem in the Big Ten as well. Exactly. I could see this team going under a seven. I could see him going over. I mean, like you said, yeah. five and zero start. It would be hard to see him not going over seven if they started five and zero. But the back half yeah, of that schedule, they've got five all five of their, right. they've got all five of those ranked opponents, which it says four. It's five in the second half, really, of that schedule. I mean, it's just it's it's a tough schedule. I could see them going under. I could see him going over, but I think their ceiling really even maybe just a push seven and five. I think it. I think the ceiling is seven wins, and I think so. I mean, I think probably see him. The safe money is under seven. I like that. I like that call out. And finally, the 18th team, the Wisconsin Badgers. Now Luke Fickle in his second year. Obviously, Wisconsin, you know, of rich history of, of being successful in this Big Ten conference, playing Big Ten football. They have a very tough schedule this year, including Alabama in the non-conference, have to go to Kinnick Stadium, host Oregon and Penn State, go to the Coliseum, go to Lincoln, go to Piscataway. These are all tough games, and I think that people don't realize how tough the schedule is going to be for Wisconsin to manage. Yeah, but they could really prove themselves with this schedule, I think. Absolutely. Um, they're always a contender in the Big Ten. They're always the team to look out for. They could win some games that people might not see them winning. I think they could also lose some games people might not see them losing. And I have that big arrow point to that South Dakota game. And the reason for that is South Dakota, you might think, South Dakota? Really? What are we doing here? Well, South Dakota, they're, they're you know, not a bad football team you know, South Dakota, yeah, they finished tied for fourth in the FCS uh, coaches poll last year at the end of the season. They're fifth right now to start the season. This is a tough FCS program, one of the best in the country. And they are going to be looking ahead to that Alabama game. They cannot take that game off. 110%. South Dakota could sneak up on them, give them a game, especially with big noon kickoff coming into town that next Saturday for probably the biggest non-conference game in that stadium ever. Yeah, absolutely. So just it's important for Wisconsin to take it one game at a time. I think that they can be a very good football team, a nine-win team this year, but they have to take it one game at a time. Absolutely. So now we'll move on to – we'll shift gears a little bit away from the Big Ten. We've got a couple games coming up here tomorrow um, that we should be excited about. And – the first one here is it's in Ireland. It's number 10 Florida State. It's a conference game here in Ireland. They're taking on Georgia Tech. College game day will be there. This will be in the same stadium where Scott Frost attempted an onside kick. Up by 10. Did not get it. Never scored again. Lost to Northwestern, who then lost their next 11 games in this exact stadium. Weird things happen is what I'm trying to say here. Florida State, 10.5 point favorite, replacing a lot, maybe a question mark or two in Florida State. What are we thinking here, Gavin? We're going to pick this thing. I think I'm going to take Florida State and the points. You like Florida State minus 10.5 here? Yep. Not much to say about it. I think Georgia Tech is just too easy of an opponent for a top 10 team to, to, to fumble it. You know, I think. If they if they if they manage to lose this game, they should probably drop out of the top twenty five. Absolutely, and and Georgia Tech 
you know, they they went to a bowl game. They won a bowl game seven and six last year. Returning their quarterback, they're not going to be a pushover. They gave a lot of good teams really good games last year, and I that's why I'm going to take Florida State to win. But I'm going to take Georgia Tech to cover the ten and a half. I think that this is a a team that's going to hang around. Um, it's going to be you know a, a completely new environment for both of these teams playing across the pond in Ireland. I think it's going to be a close game, especially given it's early, you know, week zero. Haven't had our full fall camp, really. I like uh, I like Georgia Tech to hang around in this game. And now we're moving on to a different storyline in a different way. We've got the fourth ranked team in the FCS. We've got Montana State going to New Mexico. New Mexico is a 13.5 point home underdog against an FCS team. This is the largest spread in favor of an FCS team ever in the history of the sport. And FCS teams are 17 and 4 when they're favored over FBS opponents. Montana State minus 13 and a half lost to North Dakota State in overtime in the FCS playoffs last year. This is a game that people might want to, you know, circle them to to watch. I think that Montana State has a really good chance in this game, as the as the spread indicates. Gavin, what are your thoughts? I mean, I would tend to agree. I think you can just look at that seventeen and four FCS teams against FBS when they're favored. I think with that kind of stat line, you have to pick Montana State. I don't know. The thirteen and a half seems a bit hefty, so I'd probably take Montana State to win and New Mexico to cover. Um, I'm going to go the same way on, on one of those. I'm going to take Montana State. I'm going to take them to cover the points. I think Montana State is going to dominate this game. New Mexico is miserable. Um, New Mexico, brutal, brutal, brutal couple games to start the season. They have to go to Arizona then week one after this game. I think they're going to get pushed around the field, beaten to a pulp by what is you know a really solid Montana State program, obviously, with uh, that fourth spot in that FCS poll, they, they've earned it. And there's definitely a couple of matchups that we'll be looking at next week on the podcast um, with week uh, week one's games coming up. There's some FCS teams that have a chance to, to make some noise against some, some FBS opponents for sure, and we'll definitely touch on those. And then we'll just close this and, out. Uh, sorry. sorry. One more Go final ahead. point on that yep. State game. What do you think will be the clock situation? I think – what what do you think Montana State will do in terms of the clock? I feel like Montana State's in going to be in a position to where they're going to be able to play the game at their own pace, you know, dominating the clock. Time of possession will be heavily in Montana State's favor. I, I think they're going to be able to do what they want on offense when they want to do it, and and I just don't see New Mexico having any sort of fan base support for this game. Montana State might even have more fans in the stadium than New Mexico. Oh. And, wow, and I think that they're gonna they're gonna dominate the clock absolutely one hundred percent. Thank you for that. Yes, you're welcome. And let's touch touch a little bit more on this week one matchup that the Hawks have coming up here in a couple of weeks, really a week and a day. Um, the Hawks, you know, starting the season with Illinois State. This is uh not the first time we've played Illinois State. Um, actually, we played them in two thousand and fifteen. Uh, which obviously kickstarted that 12 and 0 campaign, um, and we beat them 31 to 14 in uh, in 2015. Um, and this year, once again, starting it off with Illinois State, FCS team, not ranked in the poll, um, not a very good football team. What do you expect the tone to be set, especially with Kirk Ferentz not being on the sideline? How do you think the Hawks are going to respond? I think it's going to be really key that the Hawks come out firing here. I think they're going to have to start the season in a similar way that they did last year, you know, with that, that immediate touchdown drive. And I think they're, they're going to want to do that for Kirk. I think Kirk's going to be sitting at home watching his Hawks. And I think, you know, I, I, I saw Cade on a podcast the other day, and he was he was talking about Kirk Ferentz. And, just how he doesn't want to let him down. I think the team is really going to feel that energy, and they're not going to want to let Kirk down, even even when he's not on the sideline. 
And I think this is going to be a real tone setter for the season. I think they got to go out and dominate, maybe put up 50 points against them and maybe continue an, an offensive path for their season, get some confidence on the offense, be able to pass the ball. If they can pass the ball this year, if the, if, if the offensive line holds up for more than a couple of seconds, you know, and Kay can get the ball out, I think, I think Iowa could really – really do something this season maybe maybe challenge for a playoff spot 100 percent, and i think the key to all this is the schematics that are going to be implemented and have been implemented by tim lester what's the playbook going to look like are we going to be more Mm -hmm. shotgun based are we going to try to spread it out a little bit more you know run some hopefully shorter developing plays like you talked about that offensive line maybe being a question mark being able to open up the run game, you know, by what people say, the extension of the run game, you know, getting the getting the tight ends involved on, on quick passes. You know, Caleb Brown won't be playing, obviously, as well week one with that uh, DUI suspension. But moving forward from even just this week one game, getting the ball in guys like Caleb Brown's hands, getting it in their hands quickly, right off a snap, whether it's a screen action, a crossing route, you know, a hitch, anything to get our playmakers involved, to stretch the defense out. That's going to be the way that this team is going to be able to run the football, by passing first to shift that defense out towards the perimeter. And I think that they will find the most success with our very talented, very deep running back room uh, in, in finding some holes when the offensive line maybe isn't built this year for that lineup in the ace back, first down and 10, obvious rundown, handing it off, you know, getting yardage. It hasn't been the MO of his team for the last several years. And I don't see it being the MO of his team this year, which is why I think it's important that we get not only, you know, for the wide receivers benefit for the running backs benefit, but also for Cade's benefit, getting him confident in maybe opening up the playbook for some, some downfield shots. Um, and, you know, maybe even not in this game, but moving forward to, to Iowa State in the next week and, and the rest of the, the Big Ten slate yep. beyond that. Yep. And another another fun thought, you know, there's been some 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 question marks about the quarterback situation. And, you know, Kirk has said uh, that all three guys are getting reps. And I think maybe Tim Lesher could do some fun things with that situation. I think Linez is a good option for as a running quarterback. Maybe, maybe, you, maybe you have a, a situation where – you pull Kate out of the game and you put Linez in for a play and he picks up 10, 15 yards. I mean, you saw him do that in the bowl game. He's kind of a monster in that way. 100%. And you could, you could utilize that. You could, you could get a little unconventional. have a little two quarterback kind of setup, you know? And we saw that's what Jeff Brome and Purdue did in 2021 in Kinnick stadium, rotating quarterbacks opened up the, the ways that they could attack uh, our defense just that much more. I'd really like to, you know, expand on what you were talking about, putting Marco in the game, um, especially maybe in, you know, in the red zone, putting him in for a third and short or a second and short and, and just opening up, you know, endless possibilities, whether it's, you know, a read option, it's a, it's a RPO, it's a, it's a quick hitter pass. It's a, it's a rollout, you know, design quarterback run, whatever it might be trying to just, use what we have use the personnel we have to our advantage stretching that defense out making them think about yeah. another thing that they have to stop and i think that marco Linez definitely has the tape to back up that he has that in his locker yes he certainly has that ability i think i think a key for offensive coordinators at iowa has been to be creative i think iowa Football is at its best when it's creative and it's fun and it's different. I think Ohio State you saw, 2017. Exactly. Ohio State, you saw Brian Ferentz get creative with the playbook and just dominate on the offensive side of the football. I think we need to get back to that, quite, quit being so safe, and I think we could have a really fun season this year. That's, that's, that's all it is. is it's, the, it's the playing to not lose play calling instead of the playing exactly. to win play calling. Going out and trying to go at the defense, challenging the defense instead of making the defense come to you. Because that's sort right. of the approach Iowa takes on the defensive side of a ball. Let the offense get what they want. You know, you want to get that little four yard out route, you can get it. Come to us. We're there. You can't throw down the field. The defense wants the offense to initiate. I think that the offense needs to not want 
the other team's defense to initiate, which has been the case in several of the low-scoring games we've seen, especially last season, especially with Deacon Hill under center. The inability to do anything on the offensive side of the ball, just hoping that the defense makes a mistake. That's what several games came down to last year. Any uh, final thoughts here? Um, my final thoughts, not, not in particular. Once again, we appreciate you leaving a like, comment, and subscribing to the YouTube channel here. Uh, in addition to that, um, Hawks by a fucking million. That's right. Hawks by a million. Hawks by a million. We will see you guys next We are not week. associated with the Wash Up Walk-Ons, by the way. No, we are not. But Hawks by <laughs> a million. And we will see you guys next yep. week. Probably a podcast dropping on Wednesday. Um, and now we'll be able to preview the, some of the Thursday games that we want to talk about. Um, as well as the, the whole week one slate. And, and we can really get into depth in, in some of those matchups and get some of those picks going. But uh, this was like a good little good little uh, podcast here to just kind of take a little peek at, at what the Big Ten has to offer this year. Um, and uh, absolutely, uh, uh, Gavin, if you have anything else you want to add. I have nothing else to add. I think we covered everything. That was a quite a long podcast. It was. Perfect. Folks, we'll see you guys later. And as always... Hawks by a fucking million.